Welcome, Vineyard family. How are we doing today? Good. All right, if you can just stand up and right where you're at, let's worship together. Let's put our hands up together.
us bow down before him. His banner is love over us. And his mercies are new every morning. And whoa, whoa. And so we lift you high, forever lift you high, high within our hearts, high within
to see it. It took me so long to believe it, that you choose someone like me to carry your victory. Perfection could never earn it. You give what we don't deserve and you take the broken things and raise them to glory. Well, you are my champion, giants for
Jesus, we just thank you that you are here. And you are alive and well. My King, there is none like you. You are the champion of champions, my God. And at this time, O oh Lord, I'm reminded of your words where you say, my peace I give to you. And then you follow it up by saying, and I have overcome the world. My God, you are the champion of champions. You are our champion. Yes. And this is why we worship you. This is why we adore you. This is why we stand in awe of you. And it's in your most awesome and precious name, King Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, we serve a God who is the champion of champions. Yeah. All right, we are so glad that you are here, whether you're worshiping here online or on the couch at your home. I mean, we are extremely glad. Um, just take the next couple of moments to meet and greet your neighbor. Good morning, Vineyard family. It is so good to be here worshiping with you all. Man, there's nothing like it. If you're joining us online, welcome. My name is Julia Moyer. I'm one of the senior directors here at the Vineyard. And if this is your first time visiting us, we want to get to know you. So we invite you to complete this Connect card located in the back of your seat. Once you've completed it, you can take it to any of our info areas located in our lobby in exchange for one of these lovely gifts here. Mm. And if, you've jo if you're joining us online, go ahead and click on that I'm new here. We can hardly wait to get to know you. Now we've got a lot of announcements that we wanna share with you, so I'm gonna turn it over to my sister Cassie to start us out. Well, thank you, Julia. Good morning, everyone. We are so excited that you're here with us today. Um, and I know that for me, once I start growing and growing into what God was leading me into, I received promptings. I'm sure you know the promptings I'm talking about, I right, Julia? Indeed. So some of those promptings might be something like, you know, you're at Kroger, just minding your own business, and you get a prompting from the Holy Spirit, that person needs prayer. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what do I do? Well, you may want to do it, but you may feel apprehensive not having that confidence and more importantly, not being equipped to do so. Well, guess what? Our Breakthrough Ministry is doing a prayer training. They will equip you. They will give you the confidence that you need to step out on faith and be obedient to God. So what are we going to learn in this uh, prayer training? You're going to learn L-shaped listening. You're going to learn that five-step prayer model. Not only are you going to learn it, but you are going to practice it. So please, please, if you are interested, if you are getting those promptings, please be obedient. Join us next Saturday right here at the Vineyard. More information on that is in your program. And it's important that you RSVP because we are serving both breakfast and lunch for a minimal fee, but it's well worth it. So we look forward to seeing you there. Now you have another announcement that sounds yeah, pretty fun. Speaking of next Saturday, we are going to have a block party. Hey. That's right. Uh, next Sunday, after each service, we are taking it outside. Yeah, so over the last few months, we've kind of reimagined our Saturday nights. And you may remember we've had worship night, we've had the prayer experience, we even had the discipleship training recently. Well, this month is going to be no different, except for we are moving it from Saturday to Sunday, next Sunday. Like I said, after each service, we'll have bouncy houses, we'll have ice cream, we'll have snow cones. I mean, we're gonna have that and then some. So <laughs> invite some friends, we wanna see all of you there. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of fun. I will definitely be there. Yeah. And also next Saturday, or next Sunday, sorry, um, we are doing our baptism class. Um, I know I speak for both Julie and I, baptism Sundays are our favorite Sundays of the month. Um, it's an opportunity in a safe place where we get to be in the presence 
um, with those who are just giving their lives to Christ, witnessing that rebirth. It's so exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and again, so it's next, the class is next Sunday. Um, but we want to show you a brief little video. of the good news of Jesus, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, is that we get to encounter the person, the power, and the presence of Jesus on a daily basis. Every one of us, every one of us, every one of us. Yes, yes. This is why we do what we do. So let me just say, on behalf of all of Vineyard Cincinnati, thank you for demonstrating and sharing the heart of generosity through the giving of your tithes and your offerings. I mean, this is what it's about, right? So if you would like to be a part of that and you want to continue to give, you can do it one of three ways. My favorite is text. Uh, or you can go online, or you can simply just fill out an envelope that's located in the back of your seat there, or in front of your seat, and put a check or cash in that and drop it off in any of our offering boxes located in the lobbies. Let's pray over this offering, shall we? Father, we just thank you uh, that you are faithful to give seed to the sower. And so, Father, we just ask that you would Continue to bless us and entrust us uh, with our with gifts and talents and financial resources that might be sown back into your kingdom to bring forth a fruit and a harvest that this city has never seen. And so we thank you that here at Vineyard Cincinnati, we get to be a part of your big God story. Bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How y'all doing? Well, I love movies. I love a good story. We all love a good story. We're made for story because God put us in his story. So for that reason, years ago, I went to a script writing seminar because I was fascinated by what makes a good Hollywood script. And the presenter said, there are two primary scripts that Hollywood looks for, that they that they go after to buy. And, and you would think it would be like love or no, no. Love is actually a secondary story within the script. The two primary scripts are this. The first one, not the primary one, but the first one that I'm going to talk about is called The Cautionary Tale of the Walking Dead. It is like the story of the person that's moving from bad to worse. Like literally, the story Walking Dead, the movie, the show Walking Dead is literally about Walking Dead. Or the most famous recent one is Walt in Breaking Bad, right? Like, Walt keeps breaking bad. If you've watched this show, I mean, I haven't because I'm a Christian, but if you've watched this show, 
It's an excellent show, I've heard. Anyway, so, but it, it's an, and he just keeps breaking bad. That's the first script. The second script is, it's the, it's the story of the protagonist, the male or female that doesn't know who they are and they step into their destiny. A guide comes along and invites him into understanding that they are way more than they would ever know. It's the transformation story of that person who thinks they're a loser, thinks they're ordinary to become a hero or a heroine. You got Peter Parker. Young Peter Parker, who's the nerdy kid. By the way, just a quick show of hands. How many of you guys like Tobey Maguire as the best Spider-Man? Yeah, how many of you guys like Andrew, Andrew Garfield as the best Spider-Man? Okay, you're all wrong. His, this is the best Spider-Man. Tom Holland, without a doubt, he goes from the nerdy little high school kid who actually looks like a high school kid rather than the other two who were like 50 when they played the role. But anyway, this, this nerdy kid who steps into his identity. Remember when his Uncle Ben calls him into his identity, or Aunt May. Or, or, then, there, or then there's Eleven in Stranger Things. What a crazy show that is, right? And, and, and Eleven is this robotic character that's a nobody being abused by Papa. But then she steps into community, she becomes Elle, and she is full of love and protects her family. Or, or there's Iron Man, the best Avenger of all, right? Like, he's the funniest, and, and really, he has no powers other than his suit, but he goes from being a self-absorbed billionaire to being the selfless hero that lays down his life, if you've not seen it, spoiler alert, but he lays down his life to save the world. And then there's Creed, the young, illegitimate child of Apollo Creed. By the way, that's my body. We put his head on it. We just thought we'd... <laughs> looks just like me. That's straight eye candy. I don't care what you say, man. But he's, he's the illegitimate son of boxer Apollo Creed. He feels like a nobody. He's just an angry brawler. But then he's transformed into a man of character and depth and becomes an amazing boxer. And then one of my favorite movies of all times is Abilene Clark, in the deep racist South, she has no voice. And then she realizes she's a woman of power and uses her voice and transforms the world. Man, we love a good transformation story, don't we? Stories of the, the, the hero coming alive and understanding who they are. And not only do we love a transformation story, I believe deep in all of our hearts, we want to live a transformation story. We long to be people that live in a transformation story. And here's what you need to know. The Christian church is one of the most amazing transformation stories in history. The, the early church, after Jesus had been crucified, they scattered and they fled in fear and they hid. And then suddenly a switch flipped and they stood in power, and they were fearless, and they were full of love, and they transformed the world. They'd seen the risen Jesus. They were filled with his spirit, and they were transformed, bringing power, bringing true authority, bringing love. And here's the deal. They had no earthly power. They had no earthly authority. They, they, they didn't control government. They didn't get a vote. These people were outcasts, rejects. They were considered nuts for their belief in the risen Jesus. They were called pagans. The Romans called them pagans. They were actually called pagan cannibalists because they so believed in the risen Jesus, they'd seen him rise, and they risked their lives to share his gospel with others, and they, they celebrated his death and his resurrection by eating the body and drinking the blood like we do every week, and they were called cannibalists. They were called nuts, and yet they changed the world. They lived so transformed that they transformed the world, and they were persecuted for their beliefs. They were stoned to death. They were put in coliseums and fed to the dogs. They were fed to lions for sport, just for their belief. Emperor Nero in the early 70s AD 
was known to put Christians on poles lining the streets of Rome. And he would light them on fire and say, that's the real light of the world, not their savior. And yet they kept going. They never stopped. This ragtag, powerless group of people with no authority lived full of true power and true authority. And their numbers grew daily. People were drawn to the amazing transformation of their lives, and they transformed their world. Acts 4.13 says these people were uneducated, ordinary men and women who had been with Jesus. And they changed the world. Because of the Spirit in them, they lived and loved like Jesus. They loved well. They did, did, did good, and they gave it all away. And they died for their faith. And they lived in power. The Roman Emperor Julian, I love, I love it, John Piper, in his book, A God for Life, quotes this early church movement and how they changed the world without any authority and power. He said the Roman, Roman Emperor Juli, Julian, writing in the 4th century, regretted the progress of Christianity because it pulled people away from the Roman gods. In other words, Christianity was growing by thousands with no money, no power, and they were pulling others into their faith. And here's what he goes on to say. Aunt Julian said, atheism, again, the early Christian faith was called atheists, has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. They, they went above and beyond to care for people outside of their community to show love and grace. It is a scandal, he goes on to say, that there's not a single Jew who is a beggar and that the godless Galileans, those, the Jews and Gentiles that were new Christians, care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well. While those who belong to us look in vain for the help that we should render them. They're going to the Christians to find help. And they were transforming their world. John Mark Comer in his book, Live No Lies, says this about the early Christians and how they transformed the world, again, with no, with no authority and no earthly power. Unlike healings of pagans, the Christians' healings were free and long-lasting. In other words, pagans would offer healings. Say, come get healed, and they would charge for it. But the Christians didn't charge. They said, come, join us. We want to pray for you. And their healings were actually long-lasting, and they didn't charge a thing. All people in their community were considered equals. There was no racism. There was no division. Women were valued, and marriages were held sacred. Christians were known to have the strongest marriages. They didn't have affairs. There was no woman on the side or man on the side. They were just them. They built families and valued everyone in the family. When people encountered Christians, it was said they experienced the reality of God, a God who empowered the powerless to live with expectancy in difficult circumstances. That's our history, folks. This is the church that we're a part of. They didn't grow. The early church didn't grow because they had great buildings. They didn't grow because they had great music or, or great speakers or any political power. They grew because they were full of the Holy Spirit and they were being and bringing transformation to their world. We've been in this series called Unleashed. And the whole point of this series is going through the book of Acts, the acts of the Holy Spirit through his people, is look at the, the fact that we've been unleashed for more. We settle for so much less, and God is unleashing us for more. In the first week, we looked, we've been unleashed for more life and more power, and then Clay talked about we've been unleashed for more purpose, and then Daniel talked about we've been unleashed for more boldness, and last week we talked about how we, we've been unleashed to understand more the fear of the Lord so we live in power and live in Wisdom. Well, today we're talking about the fact that we have been unleashed for more transformation. The invitation and the call of the gospel is that we are to be transformed and to bring transformation to our world. That's why we're here. We're not here to make money. We're not here to build success for ourselves. We're not here, here to build our own little empires. We're, we're here to encounter the living God, to be transformed by Jesus, to encounter him and experience him 
his person, his power, and his presence, and thus go into our world transforming the lives of others. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit we do that, not by any work of our own. Now, I believe there's two primary types of people here in this audience. There's a person sitting here today saying, well, you don't understand how bad I've been. I can't be transformed. I can't change. You don't know what I continue to struggle with. You don't know what I continue to do. My marriage is on the rocks. My kids are sideways. My jo- I can't change. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You can. And if you are in Christ and Christ is in you, it may not feel like you're changing, but you can and he will continue to change you. And the second person in the audience here today is going, I can't be a part of the transformation process. I don't know enough. I've never been to cemetery. I don't have, I haven't learned, that was seminary, cemetery. Anyway, I, <laughs> I've not learned enough. I'm not educated enough. I don't know enough. I can't quote the Bible like Raul. I can't pray like Clay. I'm not as good looking as Matt. I, this, here's the deal. <laughs> That's a true fact right there. <laughs> you are good enough. In Christ, you have what it takes. I don't care how young or how old you are. God has set you apart. He's made you holy in him. And he's set you apart to transform the lives of others. And if you're not engaged in the adventure of transformation, you're missing out on the story God has for you. There's so much more. The scriptures are full of Ordinary men and women who are transformed by the power and presence of God. We're going to look at one of those today in Acts chapter 9. It's a story of one of the greatest transformations in history. And this transformation story is both those people I just mentioned. This is a a transformation story of two people. So if you got your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. And there's, the context is this. Acts chapter 7 and 8, the disciple Stephen has just been martyred by being stoned. And this is, not the good, this is not the fun kind of getting stoned. This is the bad kind. This is the painful kind. The other kind's not good either, but it at least feels better. Um, I'm sorry. Is that too far? Did I cross the line there? Sorry. It's just, yeah, it's, let's pray for me right now. Just a, <laughs> Stephen has just been martyred for his faith. He's just been killed. And the instigator is a guy named Saul. His Greek name is Paul. He, he, he's... They've laid their coats at Saul's feet while they stone Stephen. And then chapter 8 says, a great ravaging of the church occurs by Paul. He he ravages, he lays waste to the church. It's believed that Paul or Saul is responsible for hundreds of murders in the name of of his beliefs. All people that were part of this Christian church. And he's not just a hitman man. This guy is brilliant. He was trained by Gamaliel, the, the, the top teacher of the day, and he was trained at the top school of the day. The, the, the seminary in Tarsus was considered the Harvard of their day. He was Jewish and Roman by birth, so his pedigree is phenomenal. And he was the youngest in the Sanhedrin. That was the Pharisaical Jewish leadership. And here's how we encounter him, or how God encounters him. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, that's what the Christians are called, the way of Jesus, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He's so passionate about killing this upstart religion called Christianity. He's, the Greek word there, he's actually breathing it in. Not breathing it out, but like he's taking up all the air in the room. This is the worst of the worst. He, he has financial status for this, and he has relational status for this. He is high and mighty, and he's the bad guy in the movie. This is the villain of the movies. This is Darth Vader. This is Joker in The Dark Knight. Or this is Thanos in the Avengers. The the good guys are supposed to hate him because he's killing them. He can't be changed according to everyone but God. Just like God. But God takes the worst of the worst and he goes and he never stops pursuing anyone. He's got a different plan. 
Now as Paul saw, went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Lord? This really literally translated sir. He doesn't believe it's God, but he says, sir, you powerful being you. And he said, and Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. Now, this is an amazing scene. Riding down the road with his entourage, going to take people out to Damascus, and suddenly, blinded by the light, Wrapped up like a deuce, you know. If you're younger and don't know that song, shame on you. It's, it was a one-hit wonder by like Manfred's nobodies. It was, there was like nobodies. He just gets hit by the light. This is the arch enemy of God, arch enemy of the gospel, and Jesus pursues him anyway. You think you're too far, you're not too far. Jesus, notice what he says, Hey, why are you persecuting me? Jesus is saying, look, my children and I are one. You mess with one of them, you mess with me. We got any mama bears out there? You see them snapping their fingers. You mess with my kid. You mess with me. And Paul's like, who are you, sir? He acknowledges this is someone powerful. And notice as Jesus tells him, who he is, notice what is not said. I think it's really important what's not said. He doesn't say, Saul, I'm so ashamed of you. He doesn't say, Paul, Saul, you disgust me. I'm disappointed you. you. I'm gonna whoop your butt. None of that. He doesn't say that. By the way, it's a good thing that we humans aren't God because I'd have taken him out. I'd be like, you're done. You suck. Boom. Like, if I was God, I'd be, you're out, you're out, you're out, done. You drive bad, done. Thank God he, God is God of grace and a God of goodness because he saved me too, and I didn't deserve it. Instead, he says, look, I blinded you. I want you to go sit, and I want you to think about what's happened. I'm going to tell you what to do. Now, this go sit thing, it's not like with our parents when we were dear kids. You go to your room and think about what you've done. How many parents have said that to your kids? You just go sit up there and think about what you've done. I'm not going to see you for like two hours because I don't want to even see your face. It's not a shaming thing. Instead, go. I, I, I want you to create space to think, learn, lean into who I am and who I want to make you to be, and who's really important to you. This is called repentance. Repentance, I used to hate that word as a, church, as a kid going to church, because I thought it was like, repent, you stink, right? I don't know why they always add A's in their words. God. And I used to hate that word, but now I love that word, because repentance isn't about acknowledging how bad I am. Repentance is just changing the way I was looking and turn and look that way and look at how good he is. Repentance is about acknowledging my need for him and I can't do it on my own. This is the first step to transformation. If you're in the transformation process, the first step is to to repent and say, I can't do it on my own. And then we repent daily, not to get God's love and affection, but we repent daily to remember our need. We're told he sits and thinks about what he's done for three days, eating nothing, just listening, just praying. We have no idea where his entourage went. It's, we're told they heard the voice, but they didn't know what happened. They just know their leader has changed. In this same story, transformation number, number two occurs. Here's where it goes. This is a lot of us, by the way. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, I love the fact that Ananias is in a posture of listening. He's available to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. If you're available to hear the voice of the Lord and you hear him speak, you always respond with that sentence. Here I am. That's part of transformation. I'm available. 
And the Lord said to him, rise up and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man, for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Now, here's what you need to know. Ananias is a nobody. We know nothing about Ananias. We hear nothing else about him except he's referenced in Acts chapter 22 and 26 when Saul, now Paul, retells his story. He's just a nobody. He's no one special, but he's available. We don't know his age. We don't know his age. He's just surrendered his life to Jesus, and he's available to be a part of the transformation process. He's been and being transformation, transformed, but he's struggling. Look what he says. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. Ananias is in a wrestling match. The Lord is like, really? This guy? No, 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 no. This guy is Hitler. This guy is that neighbor I can't stand. This guy is that, that girl with her reputation. This, this is my mother-in-law. This is a Republican or a Democrat. I don't talk to people of the opposite side. No, 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 no. This is the arch enemy of the faith. And God's like, Ananias, I have other plans. I have other plans you cannot see. Let's look what God says to him. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he has, must suffer for the sake of my name. I love this story. God's like, no, no, no. Ananias, you don't understand. I'm going to use this guy. Unlike any. He writes like 13 letters. He goes all over the known world planting churches in the name of Jesus. He loses everything. This is the top dog in the faith. He's got money glory. He's got power. He loses everything. Later in a in a, one of his letters, he writes, I had everything, but I count it all rubbish, garbage, compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He's transformed, and he is used by God to transform the world. I love this. Well, Ananias does what he's told to do. He goes and prays for Saul and then the scales fall off Saul's eyes. He receives the Holy Spirit, and he's baptized. Step two of transformation is receiving the Holy Spirit. First is repentance. I can't do it on my own. We're looking that way. We look this way. And then we say, Holy Spirit, come in. And the Holy Spirit is the only way you can change. Without Holy Spirit in you, you can't muscle up and work hard enough. Holy Spirit is the one that gives you the ability to say no to sin, gives you the ability to turn off the computer and not look at porn, gives you the ability to not gossip, even though we still struggle with those things. But the Holy Spirit is the one that gives you the power and the ability to say no to those things and say yes to him. That's step two. That's why we're having baptism in two weeks. Sign up for the class. Get, get, if you've never been baptized, it's a supernatural thing that occurs. It's an outward manifestation of an inward change. But come, join us in that. And then immediately it says, Paul starts preaching the gospel. Immediately he gets up and starts sharing the gospel with other people. That's the third step in the transformation process. You have to act. If you do not put your faith into practice, you will not experience the transformation you've been given. If you do not give away what you've been given, it's a waste. I'll never forget John Wimber. The, the founder of the Vineyard Movement. A lot of people were, were going to a church and just getting a praise on and just experiencing encounters with God. And he said, if you're going to get, you got to give. If you're getting ain't resulting in giving, you're getting ain't no good. You got to give away what you've been given. Here's the deal. God wants us to transform us and wants us to be in the ministry of transforming others. To the, again, to the two groups I talked about. If you're here today and you feel like, I can't be transformed. That is not true. If God can transform Paul, he can transform you. He loves and accepts and invites 
anyone, no matter how far you fall, no matter how many mistakes you make, he has transformation for you. And the other group, you're sitting there going, but I can't be a part of this. I can't do this. Yes, you can. You get to. You need to. I don't care how old you are or how young you are. Invite your friends at the lunch table to, 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 to hear the story of Jesus. Invite your friends at work. Invite your neighbors, your, 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 your family members, your workmates. You have been put on this earth to be and bring transformation to this world. As we wrap up, three things about transformation. Transformation happens once and is ongoing. Transformation is a daily decision that you and I do to renew our minds. And number three, transform people. Transform people. Let me say a little, th- little something about each one. Transformation happens once and is ongoing. Theologically, the moment you say yes to Jesus, you've been made perfect, you've been remade, you've been ma- made new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone's in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. He has made you brand new, even in the midst of you still struggling to to, to sin or not sin. You are made new. However, you're in the sanctification process. That's a big word for means now you're trying to live that out the rest of your days. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, Paul says, You've been, you're being, we're being transformed. He is transforming us as we behold the glory of God. As we spend time looking at Jesus and spending time with Jesus, we're being transformed. That's why it leads to the second thing. Transformation is a daily decision. You get up every morning to renew your mind. Every day, that's why we get in the Word. Every day, that's why we pray, to say, every day I renew my mind. I love Romans 12, 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes later, after he's been transformed, he says this, I, remember, I challenge you to memorize this. Commit this to memory and meditate on this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Every day, lay yourself before Jesus and say, this is your life. I belong to you. I present, and notice he says, you're a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. You're already holy, even though you don't always act holy which is your spiritual act of worship. The number one act of worship we do is to offer our bodies, offer our lives, our minds, hearts, everything back to him. And then he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Every day, God, transform my mind. Holy Spirit, transform my mind. Make me more like you. And then third, get in the game. Transform people. Transform people. If you've been transformed by Christ, you can't help but be involved in transforming others. And if you're not involved in discipling or transforming others, you're not going to experience the transformation of God in your life. You won't. You'll be blocked. When you get in to help others grow, you grow yourself. When you get in to love others and help others experience love, you experience love yourself. Love begets love. Grace begets grace. Transformation begets transformation. A friend of mine, he's a peer of mine, Mike Mazel, has a mentor who's old and dying. He's in his last days. And Mike has put a camera on him and, and said, I want to interview you, ask, him, ask you some questions. This guy loves Jesus. He's faithfully followed Jesus and lived out the gospel. And he asked him, what do we need in this world? And, and this guy said, you know what? We don't need better buildings. We don't need better sermons. We don't need better music. What we need is the people of God to go love people. What we need is the people of God. And he said, if the people of God got off their butts and went into their workplaces, their neighborhoods, and we, we just love the one you're with. Just love one person. Love the one you're with. And invite them into the story. Listen to them and love them. Our churches would double in size in no time. And we're not going to double in size and triple in size because we have great communication or great worship or great bands or great ministry. Those are all great things. But we are here to be transformed and to bring transformation. 
So I want to spend some time do a little ministry here. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes with me. I'm going to take two minutes of quietness just to be still. Psalm 4610 says to be still and know that I am God. So we're just going to take some quietness, just two minutes, and repent. Repent and ask and invite. Say, wherever you are in the journey, say, God, I repent for the lies I hear. I turn away from those lies. I look to you. I repent for not believing that I can be transformed. I'm not believing you're good enough or powerful enough to change me. I repent for being dormant in my life. I repent for not stepping into the ministry and calling you've given me to live. I just invite Holy Spirit to stir and transform your heart right now. I'm going to invite prayer teams down. And the band is going to sing, call, sing a song called Power to Redeem. It's all about the idea that God has the power to redeem whatever situations we're in. None of us can fall too far. He's got the power to redeem everything by his life, his death, and his resurrection. And if you want prayer for anything, come down and get prayer. Just come and say, man, I want prayer to change. I want pr prayer to prepare to be a change agent whatever you're struggling with I want to put these ministry words up on this slide if any of these physical, emotional, or spiritual issues are going on you, read those, look at those and come and say yeah, that's for me let's believe in faith that the God of the universe wants to transform us has invited us to be transformed and bring transformation to our world Just sit and listen to the song, soak it up, come get prayer, and just rest in the power of the Holy Spirit. to 
dark with light only by the blood are we set free with mercy strong to carry shame and nail it to a tree you alone hold the power to redeem Jesus you alone hold the power to redeem you're so good, Jesus. You're so good, Jesus. We know the sun. You're so good, Jesus. You're so good, Jesus. You never left us, Jesus. Oh, my life, you have been faithful. And all my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. So, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God Your goodness Your goodness is running after It's running after me It's your goodness is running after Goodness, goodness of 
of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. The God of the universe loves you so much. He loves you. He loves me too much not to let us stay the same. He's in the business of transforming you and I so that we bring transformation to our world. Please come down and get prayer. Please come down and get prayer. If you don't want to come down and get prayer, I encourage you, I challenge you to turn with the people you're with and lay hands on each other and say, God, would you renew our mind? Would you bring transformation to our lives? We offer our bodies to you as living sacrifice. If you're with your spouse, your girlfriend, your fiance, your um, husband, wife, boyfriend, God, why am I doing all this? Kids, if you're single, just grab someone else. Say, just pray, leave here. Don't leave here without praying for one another and inviting transformation. We love you. We bless you guys. We'll see you next week.